In the past four decades, we've managed to wipe out half the world's wild animal population. For that, we have to thank overhunting and habitat destruction. If it continues, some species will disappear altogether. But at least one scientist doesn't think that has to be permanent. He wants to bring extinct species back to life. And as Sean Mallon reports, it all begins with a pigeon. The numbers were unimaginable. In 1860, at Fort Mississauga near Toronto, a flock of as many as three billion passenger pigeons flew overhead. They darkened the sky for 14 hours. The sound was deafening. That's a flock that might have been 300 miles long. You could have seen this flock moving from the International Space Station. But then, suddenly, this swelling river of life went dry. Passenger pigeons became museum pieces. The last one, a bird named Martha, died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. It was mind-boggling. Uh, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And I, I, I wanted to. I had to wrap my head around it. The pigeons were hunted for food, snared in giant nets, their habitat destroyed. Still, it was an astonishing disappearance. The grandeur of the, the billions of numbers flying through the sky, going through the forest at 60 miles an hour. And then in the span of less than 50 years, they're just gone. That sudden exit inspired California's Ben Novak to do what many call impossible, to bring a dead species back to life, something only Hollywood has ever managed to do. Push, come on. <laughs> Come on, then. There are no eggs hatching in this contamination-proof California lab. Instead, Novak is extracting DNA, the stuff of life, from some very old bird bones. The work is so sensitive, we can only film from outside. It's hard to believe that these are 4,000 years old. They've been sitting in the ground 2,000 years before Christ was born when the pyramids were still fresh and new, these birds flew over. A gift from the past to the future. The DNA he finds in these old bones may be used to build a complete passenger pigeon genome, a key early step in resurrecting the bird. Life out of dead tissue. This is very complicated. Nobody's managed to try and do something like this before. Critics say Novak's dream is more science fiction than science. His research colleagues at the University of California in Santa Cruz, like biologist Beth Shapiro, are skeptical. I think it's an exciting and an enticing idea, but it's, it's the wrong way to think about the science that's going into this research. We can't bring back extinct species. Novak disagrees with all the bravado of a scientist seized by an idea. We're going to make it possible in this lifetime. It might sound cliched, but if we go back to Edison, he, he failed making a light bulb something like 2,000 times before he found a filament that would work. And that's science. We keep trying. He may be young, but Novak has created an international buzz. He's only 27 and is doing postgraduate work in ecology and evolution. Well, it's my job to bring the passenger pigeon back to life. De-extinction isn't just about rewriting the story of the future. It's really about discovering the past. Before Novak came along, few people knew what de-extinction was. Today, it's become part of the social media conversation. There's even speculation the pigeon may be only the first of the great comebacks. In Canada, Novak's work has prompted young scientists to take a glimpse in the rear view mirror. So to actually be able to see a, 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 an extinct species come back to life would, would just be a dream come true. Jordan Mallon is a paleontologist at the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa. So Sean, I'm, I've got something cool to show you that I, I think you'll really like. Uh, this is the skull of a woolly mammoth. The specimen came from uh, the Yukon and it lived about uh, 10,000 years ago. In fact, when you lifted the case off earlier, 
you could smell mammoth. Yeah, you can sometimes get a catch a whiff of it now and then. That's those original biological materials coming out of there still that uh, we're hoping to mine for DNA. He stank. He stank, and he may stink again. <laughs> and so now it's possible that maybe in your lifetime you may actually see one real life. The boy in me would love to see that come true. <laughs> It was Hollywood that first got us thinking about the science of raising animals from the dead. Using sophisticated techniques, they extract the preserved blood from the mosquito and, bingo, dino DNA. Alas, dino DNA is all fantasy. So scenarios like Jurassic Park we're just not likely to see. Just no way of extracting DNA of any sort, yeah, usable what, sort from these. The problem with these fossils is there's just no DNA preserved within the fossil, within the bone, so, um, and it's that DNA that you really need to resurrect an extinct species, so these just are not candidates. More likely candidates are a host of these extinct birds. We've got the, the Labrador duck, we've got the, the Eskimo curlew here, there's some really cool specimens in here. Uh, this colorful Carolina parakeet got the ivory wood build woodpecker but the passenger pigeon dead a hundred years is a perfect candidate for resurrection at least to Ben Novak just by looking at pigeons you can discover a great deal about biology and evolution and humanity it's a power bird it's the super bird and if that super bird ever flies again it will have a strong Canadian content Next, the first passenger pigeon in more than a century might be Canadian. That's all the material you need to extract enough DNA to determine the genomic sequence of the passenger pigeon. When Canadian ornithologist Mark Peck was enlisted in the Great Pigeon Comeback, this was his first stop, a storage room deep in the heart of the Royal Ontario Museum. In his care, a flock of corpses, a collection of the dead. It is the largest in the world. We have about 142 actual skins of pasture pigeons. All the birds are labeled, and one was known as Passenger Pigeon 1871 from the year she was shot by a Toronto hunter. Number 1871 would turn out to be very special, but Peck didn't know that as he began his careful surgery. The remarkable part of this whole process is the fact that we can take a bird that is 140 years old, that has been in the, a museum cabinet most of that, that time period, and take a small skin sample from the toe, as we're doing here now, that's all the material you need to extract enough DNA to determine the genomic sequence of the passenger pigeon. That sample was shipped from the ROM to Ben Novak's lab in California, and it caused a sensation. Passenger pigeon 1871 definitely outshone all of our previous work it gives us a platform. It's going to give us an entire genome sequence that's really high quality. And the more genomes, the merrier. In other words, Bird 1871 had more good, usable DNA than any other museum specimen. But besides 1871, Novak has other, even older bird remains to work with. There's tiny amounts of DNA trapped in this powder of bone inside these tiny little cavities inside the bone, smaller than anyone's eye can see, even a microscope. Some of the bones are 4,000 years old. Extracting the DNA and refining it is a delicate job. Next comes some complicated math, something only a high-end computer can do. So after we get out of the lab, the end product is, is what we're looking at here. We put all that DNA into a sequencer, and every little DNA molecule in that sample ends up getting decoded one letter at a time into these strings right here. 
that's what keeps me going to work. I, I love this stuff. I could stare at these A's, T's, C's, and G's over and over again. In the end, all these bits and pieces will come together like a jigsaw puzzle into a biological blueprint of the passenger pigeon. And Novak will graft that blueprint into a living bird, the band-tailed pigeon. So now that we know that this is the genetic cousin of the passenger pigeon, the goal is to take this bird and through genome engineering, turn it into this extinct bird. If everything goes exactly right, in as little as eight years, the first reborn passenger pigeon could take wing. After that, well, the sky's the limit. There are thousands of extinct species. The passenger pigeon is a first model. We can use this species to open a door. Still, many scientists wonder if de-extinction is a door we even want to open. I think this is really folly. Alan Baker is the head of natural history at the ROM. Perhaps we should realize that extinction and speciation are a natural process. Yeah, okay, we'll bring one back and we'll put it in a zoo, okay? What does that do? Toronto ornithologist Mark Peck. Do we want to see three million birds flying back into Toronto each spring to feed on everything that's around? Do we want our backyard and our bird feeders covered with pasture pigeons? But Novak says his critics don't see the bigger picture. Just by looking at pigeons, you can discover a great deal about biology and evolution and humanity. This is about rewriting a different future to change the world for the better. I think this particular project is kind of a silly idea. Evolutionary biologist Beth Shapiro works with Novak. Her verdict on de-extinction? Forget it. My goal in this is not to bring back the passenger pigeon, but to develop a new way of thinking about how we might deal with the extinction crisis that's going on in the present day. In other words, use DNA not to bring back the mammoth, but rather to make a better elephant, one that can resist cold. Or use genetic engineering to make endangered birds more adaptive, like this rare pigeon from New Guinea. To help prevent their extinction, that to me is really exciting and fascinating and worthwhile research. But Ben Novak has a different, more dreamlike vision of the future. We'd have pianos and cellos playing, and, and I'll, be, I'll be an old man. I'll be able to walk out onto the dock of some little pond or lake out in the woods, and it'll be early, the sun coming up. I'll hear a, that whirring in the wind. A few passenger pigeons are going to fly overhead, those living, breathing, beautiful entities, an essence of that moment that was, that was my entire life. That's, that's pretty amazing to me. Coming up later this season on 16 by 9, the cost of cancer treatment when your life is on the line and your life savings too. I would have liked to have retired. You may breathe normally. Unfortunately, something called cancer got in the way. You've got cancer. It's like total shock for everybody. I've been to hell. I know what it looks like. There was a pill on the market, and it could help her. It was a very expensive drug. It can be hundreds, thousands of dollars, uh, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars. That's, that's money I don't have. There's no savings. That was her lifeline, the pills, and the government would not pay for her lifeline. Every single country with universal coverage for health care provides universal coverage for prescription drugs, except for Canada. I watched her take her last breath, and that was hard. And that is our broadcast for tonight. I'm Carolyn Jarvis. From all of us here at 16 by 9, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Thank <laughs> you.